Welcome back to Calculus 1. Um, today we're going to continue to talk about our the limits of the lower and upper sums. Uh, we had to, I had to um, um, break this video apart into two pieces because it was getting a little bit too long. It was getting too many I's and N's and M's. All right. So what we so if we if we go back to the last example, we talk about. Um, right here we talked about eventually the upper sum and lower sum as n as a number of sub interval increases or the rectangle increases to infinity okay the upper sum and the lower sum were eventually equal to each other okay so when we talk about the limits of the upper and lower sum let f to be continuous and non negative on the interval from A to B. The limits as n go into infinity for both the lower and upper sum exist and are equal to each other. That is to say, the limits of the lower sum as n equal to infinity, and then remember the lower sum was using the uh, minimum value, okay, times the width, will eventually equal to the limits of the upper sum where our delta of x is the width of our rectangle or the intervals and f of lowercase mi and f of capital mi are our minimal and maximal value of the function f on the sub interval okay on the sub interval simply means I can pick okay any sub interval of this um, of, of all those um, minimum values all right so the reason why I write it out this way so we can see that since the limit of the lower and upper sum are the same by the squeeze theorem we talked about in other lecture videos the choices of x in the i sub interval in any sub interval does not affect the limits okay any the choices of any x value in any sub interval does not actually affect the limits and that is to say that we are actually free to choose any arbitrary x value in the i sub interval okay so another way to write out okay the area of a region in the plane okay where the function is continuous non-negative on the closed interval a to b the area of the region bound by the graph the x-axis in the vertical line at a and b is as the limits of the sum from i equal to 1 to n of my f of c sub i okay so c sub i is the arbitrary x value we can choose Okay, times the width of the interval. Okay, the limits as n go into infinity that will actually eventually equal to my area. So here is a graph representation of what is going on. So if I pick an i sub interval, I know I have a minimum value and the maximum value so if I was if I will find the sum of of the minimum value and take a limit as angle in infinity that sum will eventually equal to okay the sum of the ma all the maximum values okay in that sub intervals all right. So therefore, by the squeeze theorem, it doesn't really matter inside that i interval. It doesn't really matter what value I pick. Eventually, the limit as angle to infinity will be the same. Therefore, I can choose a number called c sub i, okay, inside the i sub interval. Okay, the x value I can pick. So, so now we changing, we changing from m i the minimum value in each sub interval or the maximum value in each sub, sub interval okay we change those into any x value in the i sub interval okay because since the limits are the same that means i can pick any x value in the sub interval 
okay because at the end it doesn't really matter as I increase the sub intervals okay can imagine these two imagine these rectangle get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller okay as the number of the ith interval increases if I would draw it this way if I would draw my my rectangle so little so tight okay all right eventually this c sub i or this x value eventually is actually what's on the curve within the interval so if i were actually add them all up and, okay and take the limits of n log infinity eventually that will give me the true area under the curve okay all right so this c sub i this x value i pick got to be um got to be in between oh, I got these two backwards and I apologize this is x of i minus 1 here and this is x i okay just like what I wrote here this c sub i this any x value you got it got to be between um, two other two x values so a lot of times Okay, the width of rectangle can be found. Okay. The width of rectangle, let me just set delta to x right here. The width of rectangle can be found by taking one of the x values subtract off the other one. Okay. Now we can now we can find the width. The width of the rectangle of the eyes. Sub interval. The delta of the x equal to b minus a divided by n is basically, in a way, is telling us that all the all the sub interval has an equal width. Okay. But this c sub i is actually going to be between two x values. So, if if this is the fifth x value, okay, then the one before that must be the fourth. So I can pick a number in between, pick another x value in between these two, okay. All right. So again, changing the minimum value and the maximum value of any subinterval into another arbitrary x value that's inside that same subinterval. And when we do a, when we do the summation and take the limits, okay, it will eventually equal to our area because it's for the simple fact that we are making these rectangles. The, okay, we are increasing so many rectangles, therefore the width is going to be um, getting smaller and smaller. All right, so let's try an example. Use the limit process to find the area. Okay. So a lot of times um, when we do a problem like this, it was really for convenience. Okay. All right, my delta of x, the certain number we use, is really for the convenience of it. Okay, it makes things a little bit easier to work with. All right, b minus a divided by n number of intervals. So that would be one minus zero divided by n, which is one over n. So my width. It's going to be 1 over n of all my sub interval equal width. All right, I'm going to choose any arbitrary x value in the i's sub interval. Okay, so this x value I choose, okay, going to be 0 plus, okay, i times. You know, in, remember the a times the i sub interval times the width. Okay, so if we go back to something we wrote a long time ago, it was at towards the be beginning. Okay, all right, right here, the first one times delta the x, the second, so these one, two, okay, are my i, and the last one is all the way up to n. Alright, 
i times delta to x which is 1 over n so that's going to give me 1 over n i Right, so basically what I'm choosing here, just for the convenience, I'm choosing a right endpoint. Because by the time I finish taking the limits, it doesn't really matter if I would pick the right endpoint or the left endpoint. So let's say this is my right endpoint. Okay, so my area will equal to the limit as n going to infinity the sum from 1 through n of all my c sub i times delta to x alright so let's write it out let me put it down here so there's going to be limits of n to infinity sum of 1 through n I'm going to plug this in okay f of c sub i c sub i is 1 over n i I'm going to put that into my function x to the third so that will give me 1 over n i to the third power times my width which is 1 over n So just to th make things easy, okay, I'm gonna take this one over n to the third power to to the front of my summation. So that's one over n to the third my summation. Uh, I'm not gonna use that. Use a brace because I got a limit on the outside now. And I'm going to put my sum of i to the third okay, in the bracket. So you can see when I'm, I'm going I'm go, the next step will be expand this thing and then times this 1 over a and then take the limit at the very very end. Alright, so Let's expand my summation here. n to the third power. n to the third power will eventually become n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4 times 1 over n. Okay, so if we go back to that summation formula okay to the third power is n squared times n plus one squared over four all right so let's expand this thing here this is to the third power Well, I guess I'm multiplying all these stuff. So let's see if we can cancel anybody. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel my ends out before I multiply it out. All right, the n squared and that can cancel. They leave me with one n in the bottom. So this is gonna be one over four n squared times the n plus 1 squared, the top. And I'm going to go ahead and put this at the top. n plus 1 squared is n squared plus 2n plus 1. So if I will simplify these, if I will split that into three separate terms, it's going to be limits as n going to infinity n squared over 4n squared is 1 fourth. 2n over 4n squared is 1 over 2n. 
1 over 4 n squared is 1 over 4 n squared. So as the limit going to infinity, okay, this n gets super large. 1 divided by super large will approach to 0. So is this one. So that just leaves me with my limit is equal to 1 fourth. Alright, so that tell me that in this interval from 0 to 1 of this function, okay, the area is only 1 fourth. Let's try another one where we actually at a different interval. So far, I've been start starting you off with one. Excuse me, starting you off with zero. Now I'm going to start you off with the beginning interval is one. All right, I'm going to actually grab this function real quick. So I can show you um, some of the drawings um, I, I got up from the graphing calculator. 4 minus x squared. I want to I want to go from 1 to 2. So I'm gonna go from 0 to 3. Let me do from negative 1 to 10. Okay, something like that. Alright, so I'm go from zero to go from zero to two. I'm set up as from zero to three. So somewhere in this picture So let's say 1 is here, 2 is here, okay, I'm going to pick an interval, I'm going to pick an interval or a rectangle here, alright, so let's say here is my rectangle, alright, so I'm going to pick a right endpoint, what I want to show you is, uh, is even though the function is decreasing, okay, I can still choose a right po right endpoint because after I took the limits, on it was the upper and lower sum will be the same regardless. So I'm gonna say my width of this rectangle to be b minus a over n, which is one over n choose any arbitrary x value in the i subinterval. So let's say this is the i subinterval. Okay. So my c sub i would be a plus a is 1 plus i subinterval times delta to the x 1 over n. No, just be 1 plus 1 over n i then. Alright, so that's what that point is. I'm going to take this point, if you're into my function, and take a limit, and into all the summations. Okay, so this is any given c sub i in, in the i sub interval. Alright, so the limits of sum from i equal to 1 to n of f of c sub i times delta to x. So this is using the definition of limits. My c sub i this is f of c sub i 1 plus 1 over n i times Delta to x is 1 over n. Alright, put this into my function. Mm, my function is 4 
minus x squared so this is my x squared all right and I'm gonna times the height 1 over n and I'm gonna put the bracket right here and then a brace so we leave out the limit at the very outside. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit. One plus one over n i squared. This i is basically being to the top. I hope you don't mind if I write this on the top real quick. That would make my that would make this thing look a little bit easier. If we do 1 plus i over n squared, that would be 1 plus 2 times a times b, which is 2i over n plus i squared over n squared. And we got to get subtracted by 4. So this will change all the signs. So that means this gonna be this one will be a negative, the next one will be a negative, the next one will also be negative. Because I'm subtracted by four. Alright, and I'm gonna do the summation of all these four terms here. One over n my limits on the outside. Oops, not x, that's n. I don't know why I keep on writing it though. Well, these are n right here. Alright, 4 minus 1 is 3. So let me go ahead and say 3 right now. Alright. So this is going to be the limits as n go into infinity. Right, let's, oh, let's split the sum. n times 3 is 3n minus 2 over n can be pulled out in front of the summation of this term. I leave me with an i. i is n times n plus 1 over 2 minus 1 over n squared times i squared. So we put we pulled out 1 over n squared in front of another summation sign for this term. i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 and all of these guys are going to be times by 1 over n alrighty let's see what I can cancel it out this can cancel it out so that would be 3n minus n plus 1. So that would be 3 minus n minus 1. Let's go ahead and do that. Minus. These cancels out. So that leaves me with the n down here. So that would be a 6n. If I multiply this out, that's 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. With a negative sign in front of my term, that would change all these guys. You know what? Since I already put it up front, it won't change it. 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. I'm going to change it in a minute. When I split up these three terms with that same denominator, I would do it. Let me 
you write my other stuff down. All right, let's continue to simplify. If I will split this up, 3n minus n is 2n minus 1. If I split this up now, it'll be minus n over 3. Minus 3n over 6n is 1 third minus 1 over 6n. times 1 over n will just be 2 minus negative 1 times 1 over n negative 1 over n minus n and n cancels out for the next term that will just be 1 third negative 1 third times 1 over n negative 1 over third n and the last term negative 1 over 6 n squared and I'm going to take the limits of all these guys as n go into infinity. So 2 will be 2. This is going to be 0. Negative 1 third still negative 1 third. That going to become 0. That going to become 0. So this problem just becomes 2 minus 1 third. Which is 6, 5 over 3. That's your answer. All right, so it turns out we can choose any arbitrary number, okay, C sub i, in any sub-intervals, okay, we can actually still um, find the area under the, under the region, okay, after we take in the limit as we increase our sub-interval itself, all right, now, all the stuff we've been talking about here tie into something called the Riemann sum. So, so far, all the partitions have the sub-interval of equal width. We are making an assumption of all the other um, area under the region having equal width. However, it is not really necessary to have sub-interval of equal width. We can actually have different sizes of width for all these sub-intervals. Now, the reason of the partition for the example below give the proper area is that again, as n increases, the width of the largest sub-interval will actually approaching zero. As the number of sub-interval increases, the width of the largest sub-interval will approaching to zero. Okay, so square root of x, okay. The region is going to be bound by the graph, the x axis, okay, for the interval from 0 to 1. So if I will sketch, if I do a quick sketch, of this graph, um, I believe this is going to be something, square root of x looks something like this. It's not very pretty. Alright, from 0 to 1. So let's say this is the very end of it. So this is going down to be 1. Alright, so my intervals. I'm going to use purple. So let's say the first one right here at this x value I said that's 1 over n squared the next one let's make the width even bigger and let's 
make it 2 squared over n squared. The next one, 3 squared over n squared. So if I will keep on making, if I will keep on making these uh, widths bigger than the previous one, then the last one. Making it not equal with. Let me make this one even bigger. There you go. So the last one, this last one, I'm about to hit the one here to be the last one. So you imagine the last one. Okay. I said the last one is big. The last one here got to be n minus 1 squared okay over n squared alright this one will be just n squared over n squared which is equal to 1 right here alright so, the point of the sketch is, uh, have you realized that the width of these subintervals does not have to be equal to each other. Now, um, I'm going to purposely picking, okay, the C sub i is a right point of one of these partitions, okay, where C sub i is i squared over n squared, okay. And the delta of xi is referring to the width of the i-th sub-interval. So, <coughs> my delta of xi, what is the width of one of these sub-intervals? It got to be, okay, the one behind it is got to be i squared over n squared. So, sorry, this is going to be i squared over n squared right here minus the one before that got to be i minus 1 squared over n squared okay just like this one right here so this can be n squared over n squared the one before that is the one be before that which is n minus 1 okay and I'm picking square here on purpose so I can go back and say that's n squared, that's fine. Okay, the i is referring to i to sub interval. So you pretend this is a, any i to sub interval. Alright, so what's my width of one of these partitions? So denominators are the same. So if I expand this out, that's i squared minus um, i minus 1 squared is i squared minus 2i plus 1 since a negative sign is in front I change all my signs over n squared so that give me 2i minus 1 over n squared okay so the width of one of my partition is 2i minus 1 divided by n squared I already picked my c sub i to be i squared over n squared. Alright, so the area limits as n approaching infinity. The sum of i equal to 1 to n of f of c sub i times any width of the i sub interval. That would just be um, c sub i is i squared over n squared. I'm going to put it into my function. So that would be square root of i squared over n squared times the width of my i sub interval. 
So for the convenience, that's you know the purpose I'm picking I square here. So it allows me to cancel out with the square roots. So that leaves me with I over n times true i minus one over n square. Then this n times n square is n to the third. I'm gonna take it up front of my summation. So that will be one over n to the third. I'll take a limit of it. All right, that leave me with i times two i minus one. All right, if I distribute, that gave me 2i squared minus i. So the subtraction, I'm going to split into two summation. So the limit as n going to infinity, my 1 over n to the third, now will times 2 times i squared. Expand my i squared. Over 6 minus i minus n times n plus 1 over 2. There you go. Alright, so I go ahead and multiply my width along with my square root of i squared over n squared here. So that allowed me to pull out the 1 over n to the third. So if I simplify this, uh, I'm going to say 2 and 6 cancel out into 1 and 3. The LCD between 3 and 2 is 6. So that gave me 2 times n times n plus 1. 2n plus 1 minus 3n times n plus 1. Ah, I didn't mean to put that special there. Everybody is under the LCD 6. Yeah, 1 over n to the third. And the limits. Alright, so this is quite a bit of work. So let's think about this. n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 is 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. If I get multiplied by another 2n, that will make it 4n to the third plus 6n squared plus 2n minus 3n times n is 3n squared. Negative 3n times 1 is negative 3n. Whole thing over 6. I'm going to bring my buddy into the third back so I can take a limit as n going to infinity. Alright, I'm going to combine what I can combine up top. Or I can go ahead and split them. If I combine what I can, that's 4 into the third plus 3 in squared. 2 minus 3 is minus n, the whole thing over 6n to the third. So uh, now let's divide them. This term over 6n to the third is, n to the third will cancel it out, that's 2 third. Plus, this is going to be 1 over 2n. And this is going to be minus 1 over 6n squared. So if I take the limit as n go into infinity, okay, these two terms is going to become, it will, will go to a zero. So my area under the curve will be two thirds. There you go. So even with the unequal width, okay, even with the unequal width, as the n increases, as the numbers partition increases, the width of the larger subinterval, okay, the width of this larger subinterval will eventually approach into zero, okay, because I can only fit so many subintervals in this boundary region, okay.
Okay, so if I have infinite number of subinterval here, okay, that means the width is practically become nothing. Therefore, okay, my c sub i, okay, my c sub i will actually the sum of all my c sub i, okay, will help me to eventually lead me to the true area on the curve. All right, so. I mentioned all these summation here eventually leads to something called a Riemann sum. So, Riemann sum is actually um, has a lot less restriction. So, if I can have a function to be continuous on a closed interval from A to B, like delta to be a partition of closed interval A to B is given by, okay, the beginning of the interval, the end of the interval, okay, okay, your x of 0, x of 1, x of 2, all the way to x of n minus 1. I probably write this again, and the last one is x of n. Alright, so these are number of sub it, um, partitions. Alright, there's a number of partition or sub intervals. Delta of xi is going to be the width of the i to sub interval. So, in the i to sub interval, okay. All right, the width is going to be in between right here. All right, C sub i, okay, is any points on the i to sub interval. So this is referring to the i to sub interval. C sub i is any point inside that interval, okay, somewhere in between. So as the limits the limit of n approaching to infinity, the sum of all the f of c sub i times the width of the i's interval, okay, is called the Riemann sum. And Riemann sum, okay, is the area under the region, okay, of f for the partition of delta. All right, so. This piece of uh, this bit of information eventually will lead to um, what we so called a definite integral. The width of the largest subinterval of a partition delta is the norm of the partition, and we denote it as normal partition this way. So so far we've been seeing um, the regular partition. All right, the regular partition, which is the width, okay. B minus A divided by N. So the, what I'm saying is the regular partition will give me equal width. More generally speaking, for the partition is if I do B minus A divided by okay, the normal partition, it will be less than equal to N. What I'm saying is the number of subinterval in a partition approaches infinity. Okay. As the sub intervals okay, approaching to infinity, as the norm of the partition approaches to zero. That is to say, if this is approaching to zero, okay, implies n is approaching to infinity. Now it's kind of funny. Just imagine this. One, let's say this b minus a is one, divided by this number here is approaching to zero, so that's real tiny number. So let's say my width is this small. Anything divided by something that is zero point, a lot of zero, okay, it's actually going to be a big number. Okay, and that's what this is saying that as the partition, as the norm of the partition approaching to zero, it implies that, okay, my sub interval. Okay, is approaching to infinity. Okay, it's kind of weird if I will find one of the pictures. Okay, the the converse is is not the same. Okay, we cannot say it like that. The way we say it right here is saying that if the width. If the width of a partition 
is so tiny. Okay, if the width of partition is so tiny, that means I'm actually now allowed to create more, 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 more. Okay, rectangles or the sub intervals. Okay, so and then when I take a limit of all these sub intervals. And pick any number on those sub intervals. Eventually, the limit of all those will become the area under the curve. All right. So, when we talk about definite integral, we will come back to this idea here. So, the next video, we're going to begin to talk about what we so call the indefinite integrals and the definite integrals. All right. Thank you for watching.